Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now this is the AMD Ryzen 3 1200. When it first launched back in July of 2017, it offered solid performance for its 109 US dollar price tag. With four cores and four threads, it was certainly a tempting choice in a world where Intel's best core i3s still had just two physical cores and quad-core i5s lacked hyper-threading. Granted, the Ryzen 3 had to be overclocked to match or exceed its competition, but this wasn't a problem, as this could be easily done with the included stock cooler. I managed to hit 4 GHz today by simply changing the clock frequency. Ok, maybe not. I managed to hit 3.9 GHz today simply by changing the clock frequency. Fast forward to April 2020 and once again we'd see the introduction of another Ryzen 3 1200 to the market this time priced at just $60. This became affectionately known as the Ryzen 3 1200 AF. It got a 12 nanometer Zen Plus transformation which meant it performed better out of the box and it could be overclocked to a higher stable speed. The newer better model could be identified by the letters AF at the end of its part number. Unfortunately, the Ryzen 3 1200 I found recently for just £32 is an original Zen AE part, the model that is probably far more common on the used market today. I wanted to revisit this anyway in this video because I don't think it'll matter too much which version you buy in 2023, reason being that both AE and AF chips have just four cores and four threads, something a lot of modern titles don't like. In terms of pure CPU power, the Ryzen 3 1200 is similar to a modern dual-core hyper-threaded Pentium G7400. That's definitely a comparison we'll be doing at some point for sure, but for now, let's see if the overclocked Ryzen 3 1200 can actually play modern games without turning said games into PowerPoint presentations. Ok, so for the first title we have Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, now this actually runs really well. The CPU is going to be pinned at 100% usage pretty much all of the time, even with the overclock. We could overclock it to 10 GHz if that was possible, and the 4 cores and 4 threads would still be the limitation most of the time. I've also got it paired with an RTX 3050, which I think is still at the upper end of what I'd suggest. This is probably still overkill and you'd be better off with something lower end. The stutters really aren't that bad. The only bad thing about this gameplay is the player. So let's move on to another title. Okay, so I knew Cyberpunk 2077 was going to be an absolute disaster. The RTX 3050 that I'm using is absolutely fine. The settings I've chosen in all of these games are settings that the 3050 can handle. It's just that when they're paired with a 4-core, or when it's paired with a 4-core, four 4-threaded four chip, yeah, it's, it's going to suffer quite a bit. We're seeing regular dips to 30 FPS, or the low 30s. Anyway, the frame time graph is all over the place, indicating some serious stutter. I don't know how well that stutter comes across in a YouTube video that's rendered out at 60 FPS, but I'm sure you can probably pick it up. Again, as you can see, the CPU is pinned at 100% usage, as it will be most of the time, if not all of the time today, but it is also sticking to that overclocked speed of 3.9, which, if I recall, was the sort of highest stable speed that one of these original AE Ryzen 3s could hit without blue screening, at least in my experience. I used to have one back in the day. I upgraded from an i5-4460, maybe it was more of a side grade looking back on it, and then I eventually switched to the Ryzen 5 1600, another chip that got an AF refresh as well. Okay, so, so Battlefield, do you know what I was saying about PowerPoint presentations? Battlefield 2042 is probably the prime example of that. Now, the average wasn't too bad, but the percentile lows were absolutely dreadful. I mean, all over the place. It's not that the game wasn't playable, because there were some instances where we got over 60 FPS, but for the most part, this is an absolutely horrible experience. It's not just going to be the Ryzen 3 1200 that is going to cause this, it's... It's going to be the same on a lot of 4-core, four 4-threaded four CPUs, especially when you're playing those more intensive game modes like Conquest here with 128 concurrent players. So, yeah, this, this isn't the best experience, but it's not the worst I've had in this one either, and that's saying something. Now, in the Dead Space 2023 remake, 
you're going to notice that the CPU isn't quite pinned to 100%. I do still think it's the bottleneck because when I was testing this game with the RTX 3050 before in my i5-13400F system, it was running absolutely fine with these settings. As soon as I switched out to the Ryzen 3 1200 though, yeah, this is where the stutters began. Now this is what I'd call a slower paced single player title, so you could definitely get away with playing on a chip like this if you are willing to put up with the occasional stutters. You could also implement a frame rate cap if you wanted to to make them seem less severe. But it's sort of like why would you want to if you get what I mean. If you have a card like this you're going to want more frames and this is why you'd be better off pairing the Ryzen with a lower end GPU. The thing is the sort of GPU that would be best suited to this is one that itself probably wouldn't be that capable in 2023. I mean, if you were to pair this with a 1060 or something, you'd still experience some issues in games, but I guess that's what stuff like FSR is for, right? That's actually what I was trying to think of earlier, a 1060. That would be a good pairing for one of these. That might still be a little too high, in fact, but that could be something worth considering, maybe a 570, especially with the AF variant of this chip. In Hogwarts Legacy, again the frame rate was pretty good on average, but there were a few little dips and drops here and there. This was actually a more playable experience than a few of the other games we've tested thus far, and I would happily play it like this. I think I'd have to implement some sort of cap, maybe 40 FPS, but the Ryzen 3 1200 is certainly giving us its all here. Not bad for a CPU that released in 2017, and at the time it was competing with the likes of i3 7100s and Pentium G 4560s. It's an okay experience, I think. If we move on to the Hogwarts actual section of the game, the frame rate is about the same. A few little problems here and there. Nothing major in this one, so let's move on to our next title and see how it continues to hold up. Okay, this is worse. This is this is the worst. This is Spider-Man Remastered. Um, it's been loading now. Well, put it this way. I've taken my dog out for a walk and I've gone up to the shops for a few bits. Um, that was about half an hour, 45 minutes worth of things, so... Yeah, it still hasn't loaded. Uh, I don't think it's going to. <laughs> so, yeah, not playable is Spider-Man on the Ryzen 3 1200, I don't think. Elden Ring has a 60 FPS cap in place by default. Ordinarily, the 3050 would be able to handle this. Not so much in this case, but it's still a pretty solid effort, I think. The game is definitely more than playable here. You're going to be losing a lot of frames if you have one of these quad-core quad chips in your system. I'd still definitely recommend overclocking it in 2023 because it must be making some sort of difference. It's just not ideal, to be fair. That does make me wonder just how capable a Ryzen 5 1400 would be. You know, the four core, eight threaded chips. I built some on a PC back in the day with one of those. And I think at the time they were really pleased with it because it could pretty much run everything. And I think these days it could still hold up quite well. So I think I might rebuild that system at some point. It's certainly going to do a better job than this anyway. We might also take a look at the Ryzen 5 1600 again at some point. Now the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt needs no introduction, this is the next gen patch. We don't really need to go into detail here because, well, you can see for yourself, not ideal. <laughs> not ideal at all, but I was getting similar sort of problems before the next gen patch on these older CPUs anyway, so it's nothing I didn't expect. Outside of city walls, this does improve a little bit, but those percentile figures aren't really going to smooth out all that much. CSGO is a perfect game for the Ryzen 3 1200 to be honest, not the highest frame rate in the world but with the low settings the only time I really noticed stutter was when I got killed or when I shot another enemy, the former was a more common occurrence, uh, let's be honest, but yeah to be honest the frame rate was actually okay here, I could happily play CSGO with the Ryzen 3 1200, I probably did quite a lot back in the day as well, this is more of a CPU intensive title. And this old thing can definitely hold up, whoops, about five, six years later. So yeah, wow, time definitely flies when you're having fun, that's for sure. I remember when this came out and I bought it, that's mad. Now GTA 5 is going to exhibit a few problems. We're going to stay above 60 FPS as an average, but there will be drops towards that, especially in those busier areas with more NPCs on screen. 
Things like here where you're driving towards downtown Los Santos, for example, we're going to see a few problems, but nothing game-breaking at all. The game is very much enjoyable on this thing, and I think it was back in the day. Um, when I switched from my i5 4460 to this, I remember thinking that there was actually quite a bit of improvement, so I must have been happy with it back then as well. GTA 5 very playable then on this old 4-core chip. Finally then, we have Red Dead Redemption 2 with the console equivalent settings. These are digital foundry settings which I believe match the quality of the Xbox Series X. Something along those lines. The only thing we're not, of course, doing is running at 4K. This is native 1080p instead. This will run really nicely outside of those busy city areas, but as with all older chips with lower core counts, you're going to see dips towards 30 in areas like this basically, Valentine, Sandini, those are really going to make the frame rate suffer. And of course, the chip is going to suffer as well. As I said at the start, we overclocked it on the stock cooler and it's really not getting that warm at all. I definitely recommend doing this. You don't need an aftermarket cooler, I think as I've proved here. So yeah, if you can find one of these as cheap as I found it, it might be worth it, but I'd suggest looking out for a Ryzen 5 1400 or perhaps a Ryzen 5 1600 instead. That's all there is to this one then. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the Ryzen 3 1200, a chip that got launched twice effectively, although today we've ended up with the weaker of the two. If you did, leave a like on it down below, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.